Now, that's my theory. So I'm, I haven't got very far. I need help with my theory. Uh, but I, over the years, as I've given this talk, I've, I've got feedback which suggests that there's something in this. For example, all the research done in descriptive translation studies, particularly on the cognitive processes, all the proposed universals of translation suggest that translators don't like risk. We, we find in study after study, translators tend to generalize. Translations are more general than non-translations. Translations are more explicit than non-translations with syntactic uh, ex explicitness, explicitation. Okay? Uh, in Turi's laws, we have uh, one of, of growing standardization and one of interference, that translators uh, will also avoid risk by adopting the format of the original, the, what Turi calls the makeup of the original, the way the paragraph is structured. Translators will tend not to touch that. That is, they'll rely on it, not take the risk to play with the big structures. And when you do descriptive translation studies, especially historically, you'll find that the degree of omission is frightening. That so many translators over the centuries have solved problems with a big pair of scissors. No, no don't tell them. Don't tell them there was a problem. Okay. All those strategies, generalization, explicitation, I could add in simplification under generalization as well. Uh, the, the acceptance of interference, the tolerance of interference, and, and non-translation are all ways of avoiding risk. Translators seem to be trained, or seem to be very good at, avoiding the problems, not taking risks, uh, getting rid of the hard bits, making text easy for readers. Uh, this is not an original observation by me. Apparently, it's in Ortega y Gasset, great Spanish theorist, in his text on the misery and splendor of translation. This is the misery bit. If this is true, and I suspect there's something in it, why? Why would translators be risk averse? You know, this means that if translators were betting on horses, they would bet on the favorite. Or if they were investing in the stock market, they would buy blue chip stocks that give not spectacular returns, but a steady return. Translators are going to be happy in middle class, lower middle class jobs with steady clients year after year. Here are some other reasons. Perhaps it's just not we're genetically built that way. Perhaps it's because the way we get translation jobs means somebody gives us a text and say translate, you know, all the theory about the brief, etc. Well, you know, often we don't get it. We can't see success conditions. We don't know who is communicating to whom and at what level they're going to be making a benefit in their lives. I'm not talking about financial benefit, but benefit in terms of the way they distribute the effort of, of, of living. Translators can't see that. We just get the text, so we have to work on the text. So we can't analyze the risk because we don't have information on the social context. If we get the information, we can do analyze the risk, we can probably tell the client, hey, this, this, this text is not worth translating. You know, or this bit here, I'll translate, but the rest is entirely rubbish. Or, actually, you should work on this before we translate it. It's not going to have the effect you want. Okay, so it's a problem of information blockage in many respects. Then again, the second reason. In our cultures, translators are considered not to be responsible for success. Here is a story from the great film Patton. Patton was the American general whose army occupied Berlin at the closing days of the Second World War. So you had the American army come in and the Russian come, army come in. And in the film they meet 
and you have the Americans with General Patton and the Russians with a Russian general and they sit in silence while there's Cossack dancing and things like that and at one point uh, Patton says to his interpreter tell him he's a son of a bitch referring to the Soviet Soviet general and the interpreter says quite I can't tell him that sir tell him he's a son of a bitch sir it'll be World War three we cannot tell him that three times tell him he's a son of a bitch so the interpreter does his job and the Russian sends back a message which comes back through the interpreter and he's sir he says you're a son of a bitch too and then the two generals have a toast and smile at each other they understand perfectly what they're doing okay what's the message I think the interpreter was right to say hey hey this is a high-risk thing do you know what you're doing there's high risk here but in the last analysis the general is paid to take high risks not the interpreter the interpreter had to do that because generals are paid to be generals and interpreters are paid to be interpreters there's a social division of responsibility and of reward you know, it's no good complaining that translators and interpreters are underpaid if we're not taking risks you know, running risks incurring risks involves seeking rewards that correspond to them that's one theory here's another theory I'm, I'm trying to explain why translators and interpreters might be risk averse. okay here's another one you remember I said that cheap communication can be good communication because there's more space for benefits so translators may reduce transaction costs they may make cheap communication okay make it easy to understand you know, translator invest some effort so that the the users of the text don't have to invest a lot of effort huh? because that way there will be more potential benefits okay it's it's a, it's a distribution thing if the translator reduces risks by working on the text to make it re easily understandable the people who use the text have to invest less effort if they invest less effort there's greater margin for mutual benefits all right I'll I'll do that another day I'll put numbers and things on it okay but it's a mathematical argument but it does make sense however it also stops the other people from running risks so it stops the possibilities of great benefits occurring at this stage after about two years of thinking about these things it occurred to me that it's not true that some translators do take risks people who translate jokes the translation of humor if you don't take a risk it's just not going to work you know that and they've got to be better paid I hope or get rewards from feeling funny at least people in who work on subtitles with this restricted space have to decide constantly what goes in and what goes out and they've got to be taking more risks than, than the rest of the world that can add notes and use explicitation strategies huh? highly localized text highly technical text where you have to work a lot to understand it just to translate it must involve a significant degree of risk taking okay uh, medical text pharmaceutical text are obvious examples advertising marketing strategies that I saw uh, that, that we saw in uh, we've been looking at the IKEA website okay we saw we saw that translators are just rendering the, the natural language strings but um, art directors marketing people are redesigning the entire website surely there's more risk involved there and some translators are moving across into that area translating slogans for example similarly 
texts of salvation, sacred texts, can involve high risk. Uh, think of all the effort spent over the centuries in the translation of the sacred texts of Christianity, at least, uh, since it's, it's a religion that bases its communication strategy on translation. Uh, why would all these people work so hard for so long on these old texts? Obviously, the rewards are infinite. If it's the case that this text will lead to revelation and salvation and eternal life, if the reward is infinite, as Pascal said in Pascal's Wager, then the effort should also be infinite. It's logical that this be so. So, I don't think it's true that all translators are risk averse. We have a horribly long list of Bible translators who have given their life for taking risks and political translators who have done similar things. So it's not necessarily true across the board. But I still think that on the whole there tends to be more risk aversion than risk taking. And here's my final theory. These are all partial theories. Things I, I tried to explain it, but I, I, I you know, it's not. You know. I've had to go right back to the beginning and say, well, what's the difference between communicating within a culture and communicating across cultures? Remember, I started with cross-cultural communication, and translation was expensive. You know, I've had to go right back to there and say, well, well why? What, what's so special about cross-cultural? Well, when you're communicating across cultures, and I'm doing it now, there are relatively high transaction costs. It takes a lot of effort for me to get rid of all my cultural specificity and to speak a little bit slower and to try to speak in clear English and to not offend people by going into taboo territories. Okay? Uh, even if we're doing a, a pigeon or a creole or unme or code switching, the transaction cost, the communication effort is higher than when I'm uh, with my mum, for example. Okay? Cross culturally, by definition, I think, we have relatively low trust levels. Not that I don't trust you, but hey, I trust my mum more. Uh, and a lot of what a culture is, is developed so that trust is, is easy between members of the culture. Trust across cultures is very difficult to establish and harder to maintain. Let's face it. If this is the case, then the effort invested, the, the transaction cost, is at a higher level in cross-cultural communication than in intra-cultural. Uh, we're at a high level. So the margin for benefits is narrower. When I'm talking with my brother or with my mum, and we're mumbling away in Australian English, it doesn't mean very much. Okay, uh, We don't have to work hard because we're quite enjoying it, uh, as it is. Uh, and there's lots of benefits involved. But cross-cultural means that uh, benefits are harder to locate, harder to find, harder to define. Success is harder to define as well, because we're working harder. If that's the case, then translations should be particularly good in those areas. And translators, as experts in cross-cultural communication, should be particularly good at locating those bits that require high effort, those bits that are still available. It's entirely wrong to think that we talk across cultures or communicate across cultures the way we communicate within a culture. Within a culture, the more we communicate, the better we feel. Across cultures, there are many different ideas about how much we should communicate and in what way. My conclusion, then, is that translation has to be an expensive strategy. 
because cross-cultural communication is expensive anyway, and it can only be justified in high-risk situations, should be used in those situations, and should not be used in many of the other situations. It follows that it should be well rewarded if it's used in those situations. There have been some significant objections to what I've just said. And usually I allow the audience to guess them, but I won't do that because I've got a camera here, so I'll tell you what they are. I'll tell you why I'm wrong. Trust reduces communicative complexity. If you trust someone, you don't have to work too hard to get your message across. But translators are, by definition, not trusted. A translator could always work for the other side. They've got the cultural and linguistic competence to do that. They could always betray you. I wouldn't trust a translator, would you? I mean, come on. And mistrust feeds on any minor mistake. And this I've seen. If, if, if a translator makes a minor mistake in a, an area of a text that is of no consequence, but it's a silly mistake. I think I mentioned I translated the Spanish word mil for a thousand as a million. All right, I made a mistake, okay. Hey, but my client lost trust in me. So I'm trying to argue that mistakes are okay in low-risk areas. Well, that's true if you have trust, but if you're not in a situation of absolute trust, any mistake can be fatal. And if translators are not trusted, then they have not got the freedom, the clients will not trust them to distribute effort as is needed. Okay, they're going to be re returned to what we've always been, is going sentence by sentence and not analyzing the risk. Do you, you follow that argument there? It's a little technical, but it's late in the day, come on. Right. The idea is that my theory is great if you have absolute trust, but in reality, we are the people most likely to be mistrusted, let's face it. So I've got a problem. I'll work on that. I think trust is a key theoretical issue we have to return to and analyze in far more subtle terms. Uh, second objection uh, comes from Basil Hattin, who is a text linguist, who does not like me saying that text linguistics cannot tell us how to translate. Uh, the argument is sophisticated, but I'll present it as simply as I can. <clears throat> the more you work on the text to analyze success conditions, the more you analyze the text, as people, I don't know, like uh, Christina Schaffner or uh, Christiana Nort might tell us to do, you know, really analyze your translation strategy, the more work you put in, the higher the communication effort, the less benefits there are. Yeah. This is why our societies have a default norm. The default norm is, unless anybody tells you otherwise, just translate sentence by sentence and don't ask any questions. Because, the theory goes, it's cost efficient. Because to do otherwise would mean working too hard. And I go back to square one. You now understand, ladies and gentlemen, why I have not published this theory as a coherent theory. But I'm going to try to make it coherent very soon. Thank you for your attention.